I'm just going to set up recording. Okay, so uh, welcome everyone this evening and thank you Andrew so much for joining us. Uh, I just want to give a little bit of information and then we'll get started. Uh, so uh, first, uh, we'd like to acknowledge that as we gather here, we're reminded that we're hosting this webinar on land that is traditional home of the Haudenosaunee, of the Anishinaabe and the neutral peoples. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historical connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions Indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening Waterloo Region, Ontario and Canada as well. We are grateful for the opportunity to be here and reaffirm our, our collective commitment to make the promise and the, challenge, and the challenge of truth and reconciliation real in our community. We also acknowledge that people are joining us here from all of Turtle Island. Uh, so thank you again. Uh, just some general information on how the webinar will, will work. Uh, first, Andrew uh, will have, after a brief introduction, Andrew will have a chance to uh, talk a little bit about his campaign and his uh, points of view. Um, and we ask that everyone keep themselves muted unless they're asking a question or if they're Andrew, of course. Uh, if you would like it, to ask a question, please do let us know, um, Matt's or myself. Um, let us know in the chat and if you give a brief overview of, of what you'd like to ask and then hopefully we'll get to everyone's questions. And you can turn on your mic when, um, when that happens. We are recording the meeting so that we can publish it to our YouTube channel so that others may get a chance to see all of the leadership candidates chats. So please let me know if you have any issues with that. Uh, Teresa, Matt, and myself are all organizers here as part of uh, Green Party volunteers, we don't work for or represent the Green Party. Uh, there have been no staff or candidates involved in the organizing or preparing of the questions. We've just organized this to strengthen the Green Party. And we'll also post a bit more information about up to, upcoming Q&As. Uh, and I should remind you that the uh, most impending deadline is that of September 3rd where you do need to make sure that you are a member in order to be allowed to vote. And with that, I will pass it over to Mike. Thanks so much, Stacey. Uh, wonderful to see you all tonight. And Andrew, thanks again for joining with us. I feel like I'd be remiss after, Stacey, you shared that acknowledgement of the lands we're gathered on, not to mention how um, important it is that some uh, many friends of ours are in the midst of um, an occupation in Victoria Park uh, as they uh, demand land land back and we had two really important meetings in both Waterloo and Kitchener just last last night as our councils um, work to to strive to meet those um, and so those are yeah, some folks that I know many of us are uh, are, are thinking of and, and supporting in various in various ways um, Andrew, really appreciate you making time to be with us tonight. I'll be I'll be brief um, to introduce you. I also need to share. I've um, got another com commitment um, at this same time and annual general meeting, so I'll need to be stepping away pretty shortly for that. Um, but I did want to join to uh, to to at least in introduce Andrew to the group and appreciate you all making time to be with us again tonight too. Um, Andrew's been a, a longtime member of the Green Party. I think it's four elections he's uh, ran as a candidate in now. Uh, most recently, it was a provincial by-election in uh, a suburb of Ottawa and or in or Orleans uh, just this past year. Andrew's a lawyer by trade. He's been a member of Shadow Cabinet uh, in past and, um, and is now one of nine people that is seeking the uh, leadership of the party. And as he was sharing earlier, uh, in the midst of what must be an exhausting process over so many months. Um, he's been uh, open to spending some time with us tonight and, uh, and in order to, to share more with you about his vision and also to answer questions that uh, you all might have. And so again, Andrew, really appreciate you making time to, to be with us and I'll, I'll pass it over to you. Great, thank you. I really appreciate being here. Um, the acknowledgement that I normally like to do is to talk about the uh, 
Saugeen Ojibwe Nation. Uh, it's actually where I am right now. I am from Ottawa, but I was born in Owen Sound, which many of you probably know being in Kitchener. And that's actually where I am right now. They were approached by the Ontario Power Generation about dumping nuclear waste in the land. And they stood up and said, no, they had a vote and they said, no, we're not gonna allow that. And that was great, but the fact of remains that Ontario Power Generation is still looking for places to dump this nuclear waste. And they're going to be looking at other uh, First Nation land as well. So this is an issue I know the Green Party of Ontario takes very seriously. So I'll, if, if you haven't been following this, please do so because it's something that we really should be paying attention to. That said, I wanna be the leader of the Green Party of Canada because I want the Green Party to get elected. And I don't see the Green Party being an activist party. I see the Green Party being a governing party. To win, we must have our progressive policies that help the environment and help people, but our policies must be fiscally responsible. And that's a good thing. That's our ticket to winning. We can be a party that's pro-environment and pro-people without sacrificing the economy. As leader, I want to make sure that our policies always consider sustainability, but they also always consider the economy. And I don't think that these concepts are dramatically opposed. In fact, I think they go hand in hand, and Canadians will appreciate this. There was a poll just yesterday, many of you may have seen, where 38% of Canadians think that if an election was held right now, that they would vote for Justin Trudeau because of the way that he's handled the economy during the COVID-19 pandemic. And this is in spite of the fact that he's facing his third ethics violation right now. There was a poll last year that said that a majority of Canadians are concerned about climate change, but are worried about what that would, tackling climate change would do for the economy. So all of this shows that people do want to help the environment, but the economy is still top of mind. This is why I think, I know that this is our ticket for success, is combining the two. Having strong policies that help people and help the planet, but are fiscally responsible. As everyone said, uh, as Mike said in the introduction, I'm a lawyer from Ottawa. I was originally from Owen Sound. Um, tonight, I hope to show you why I should be ranking very high up on your ballot on October the 3rd. I'm willing to take any questions that you have. That, oh, and by the way, I do know Kitchener quite well being from Old Sound and spending, I also spent the majority of my life in Toronto. So I know Kitchener, Waterloo, Cambridge pretty decently. Okay, thank you, Andrew. Um, so I will get us started. Um, who is someone who inspired you when you were growing up? Uh, you know, here's an interesting story. I have a person working on my campaign team that wanted to put together a video just on this subject. And I don't have a great answer. I know that sounds sad, but um, you know, I had a childhood was rough. I'll be quite frank, it really was. So I learned a lot about how to be an ethical person, how to be a strong person, how to be a moral person by seeing others not do that. I think that that shaped me more than anything else. Having said that, watching TV, there are definitely people that um, I watched in the media that I was very inspired by. Um, Growing up, who would I put at the top of the list as far as inspiring me? You're talking about politics wise, not just life in general. Um, However you see it. <laughs> um, I remember it was about the time when I was really kind of being very influential. It was when um, Um, Nelson Mandela was being released from prison. And um, I also remember the, the Berlin Wall coming down. 
And those were kind of eye-opening experiences for me because I didn't know the history. I didn't know the history of the Berlin Wall, I, or I didn't know the history of why Nelson Mandela was imprisoned. And hearing what you know led up to those events really had an impact on me. And um, especially with Nelson Mandela, with everything that he went through, and he was still able to carry on and become the president of South Africa uh, was extremely inspiring. That was an amazing story. Okay, thank you. Uh, David Weber has a question. Thank you, Stacy, and thank you, Andrew, for being here. Um, my, my question to you is, uh, you know, how do you envision a better way in getting the Greens message out in public discourse? Um, so many times I've been talking to people that are, you know, politically minded yeah. and you can think that they follow the Greens a little bit, but they have no idea what Mission Possible is. And even many Greens aren't aware of reimagining our, our future. Um, we need to do a, a better job at having people know what we're believing in and what we're pushing for. Um, how do you see that happening in a better way? It all comes down to having strong EDAs or for on the provincial side, CAs, which can work together. And often, let's face it, in Ontario, those are almost the same people all the time. We can, we're a grassroots party and we're not going to get much media attention. We get local media attention, but not the mainstream media. And I think we all know how difficult it is watching, you know, election coverage and the Greens are barely mentioned, if they're mentioned at all. When I did my by-election, uh, the CBC asked to do a, a small piece on the all four candidates. And that same day, that same reporter put out a big piece on the other three candidates and totally ignored the Green Party. And I have tons of examples that I could talk about of the media ignoring the Green Party. And I'm sure everyone has their own examples too. So we have to have strong EDAs to get out into the riding and talk to people. When I was a candidate uh, in between elections, I would talk to anyone who would listen. I would meet up with um, the local business associations. I would also go to high schools and talk to grade 10 civics classes about my experiences in politics. And although I couldn't talk directly about the Green Party, like I couldn't promote the Green Party, I would talk about things that are important to the Green Party. For example, I would get them to do a mock parliament. So I would split them up. I would create the classroom as um, a legislature and I would split them up based on the parties and I would get them to vote on policies under first past the post and then under and vote on similar policies under a proportional representation system and get them to see the difference about how the two works. And they can see how first past the post went really fast, but proportional representation was fairer because they had to work together to come to some sort of compromise. And funny enough, this week I had someone call me today to say that they're supporting me and they joined the Green Party to vote for me in this leadership campaign. And I talked to their class, I think he said in 2015. So he's now 18 and he's going to vote for me for this leadership contest. So it works. But if we had strong EDAs to get out into the riding, we can also go door to door more often. And we need to get our candidates nominated early. This way they can be out in the riding and getting name recognition. If we're going door to door in between elections, that's our way to get the name out. And again, here's why this is very important. Most EDAs kind of disappear between elections. Um, in Ottawa, it's the same thing, which means that when an election comes, we're already behind the eight ball compared to where other parties are. And we have to pick up speed. Sometimes we have to appoint a CFO and a, and a C, CEO. Sometimes, not always. But it just means that we're behind the eight ball when the election is going. We need to be running when an election comes, which requires us to be walking in between elections. Does that make sense? 
Um, since I asked a question, <laughs> I'm going to yes. assume you're asking me. Um, I, it does make sense. Uh, I think that there are a lot of places where we have stronger EDAs and we are as active as, as we're you know, able at the moment. Uh, and really what my question I was trying to get at a little bit more was from the National Party, how we might be able to do things a little bit differently. Because there are some places where you probably won't be able to build the EDA uh, or, you know, where it doesn't exist. You won't get it this, uh, the stronger um, in riding by riding uh, support until people more in general get the, the umbrella message from the, the head party to really understand what the Greens believe in. Mm -hmm. And if people understood better what that was about, I think more of them would come to the EDAs and say, hey, I want to volunteer or make EDAs and it would make it easier for us to get volunteers. Yeah. But um, yeah, anyway, that's, that's really where I'm still I'm mostly concerned. Okay, so two things I'll say to that. When I ran in the by-election earlier this year in Orleans, there was nothing there. Now this was provincial, so it was a CA. There's no CA there. But the fact that we are able to run a positive campaign and reach out to a lot of people it inspired enough people to want to form a CA. So that's going to be happening. So having these roots in the writing can work to create e CAs or EDAs. But your point's very well taken. And I wasn't sure that that's where you're going, but here's a point where I think we'll address your question. We as Greens, and I'm guilty of this at all, we're very intelligent and we want to explain everything to voters, hoping that if we explain enough, long enough that they will we'll convince them to vote green because our policies are amazing. Our policies are great and it makes common sense to vote for the green party, but we're very in our head. We're very analytical. And again, I'm very guilty of this as well. We need to have a campaign that's short and to the point, very blunt. We need to have these talking points that candidates can say door to door to show them this is the Green Party, this is the Green Party, this is the Green Party. So for me, it would be, we're pro-environment, pro-people, pro-economy. We can help jobs and help the environment. These basic talking points that will get across to people and stick in their mind, because that's what works for, for other parties. Um, the second point I wanted to make, and just slipped my mind, give me a second, um, is making sure that EDAs have these resources. When I ran as a candidate, it was about three weeks into the election or more that I finally got some talking points at all. So I was able to do my own research so I could go door to door and talk about what I felt the, camp, the, the platform was going to be. But especially with an election possibly coming right after this leadership contest, we have to make sure that our EDAs are ready to deliver that messaging. And it has to, again, be short and sweet and blunt to get across to people's mind. But Again, it goes back to making sure that we are able to prepare our EDAs. I don't know who's... Is okay. Here. Yep. Um, so thank you. Uh, Jason, you have a question? Sure. Thanks, Stacey. Hi, Andrew. Jason, is it? Yep. <laughs> I uh, know half of the people here, so... Yeah, which is great. <laughs> um, I know that w when I think about all the solutions we need for the climate crisis and all sorts of other infrastructure and services, a lot of it lands at the municipal level. Yeah. Um, okay. even, even though they're provincial jurisdiction, how do you see the federal government better uh, fostering a solid relationship and a helpful one with our municipalities? Well, the federal government is the government that collects the largest revenue through income tax. So we're able to provide money to the municipalities on certain projects. That's our way to make sure that they can help with our vision. For example, high speed rail, you know, that's more of a national thing, but public transportation actually is a great example of um, something that's the municipalities could do, be doing a better job of uh, with proper funding in Ottawa. We um, are building a light speed rail uh, from across the city, and we've just finished building a downtown section. The east end section has begun, but the section on the west isn't supposed to start till like 2031. 
And that's simply just because they just don't have the money to do so. So properly funded by the federal government, we can get more projects off the ground in municipalities that are environmentally friendly, including you know, public transportation and retrofit of government build, of buildings, uh, helping make more livable communities this is all stuff that uh, the municipalities want. I know the municipalities want. When I ran in Orleans, the local business association was talking about an idea just like this, and they just weren't getting the help from the provincial or federal governments. So municipalities will buy in on this. We just need to make sure that we work together. Okay, uh, Ingrid would like to ask our next question. Hello, Ingrid. Hi, Andrew. I was just typing in chat to Stacy. Okay, um, we um, have, as you know, a very diverse group of candidates, including you, who um, have a lot to offer. And I'm just wondering if you win, are you considering to pull all the candidates together, keeping them engaged? Because I think they, all have a lot to offer and I don't know do you have a plan to entice them to stay involved because you know we'd hate the Green Party needs them all you mm -hmm. know of course we need one leader but um, do you, have you ever thought about that I've heard the other contestants all say how they want to stay on regardless of who the leader is so they've kind of made that answer right. pretty easy so Obviously, they have their support and they bring a conversation to the table and our party's better when we have more voices. So yeah, I'm, as leader, absolutely willing to see how any leadership contestant can fit into running as a candidate and seeing if there's other options available, including a shadow cabinet position. Right. Perfect. Yes. That's great. <laughs> okay, our next question comes from Gordon. Uh, good evening. Uh, not very many of you know me, but, uh, but David does and Jason does. Uh, my interests have run over the years to more practical things. And one of the things that bothers me immensely is that at this point, approximately 25% of the greenhouse gases that are emitted in this country come from the transportation sector. Mm -hmm. I, th I think personally uh, there are answers to this. Um, and I don't think that the entire answer lies in the idea of public transportation, because I think the geography of our country makes it so that uh, the private vehicle um, is almost essential in so many areas. Yeah. Uh, the recent experience with COVID has turned people away from public transportation for safety reasons. Um, I've had the idea for some time that it would be a really good idea if the federal government went into a joint relationship with the private sector to see what they could do about the manufacture and possibly the design of electronic vehicles in Ontario because Ontario is the center for the auto industry in this country. Yes. I personally think that um, this would appeal in an election because it's specific and it deals with the three issues that you mentioned a few minutes ago, Andrew. But anyway, I guess my question plain and simply is, do you see this as something the Green Party could support? And is it a viable thing to be going out to people in an election and saying, we, this party would want to promote this change in the auto industry and we're prepared to put money in to do it. Yes and no. Um, the no part is that there's a strong part of the Green Party that is against the private sector. I mean, you have to you listen, listen to some of the contestants in this contest talk about that. So, and they have their support. Now, I'm someone that believes we do need a private sector. Jobs are good. I also believe that we need to get off, get rid of the combustible engine. And, you know, we should have legislation passed 
to phase out the combustible engine. But I'm also not someone who just thrusts that upon people. Like this would require, as you say, talking to the auto manufacturers and seeing how we can best set a timeline to phasing out the combustible engine. And they're going to want it later than what is acceptable. So we'll have to work with them, but we have to, I mean, we have to put our foot down to a certain degree, but yeah, we have to work with the auto industry to start phasing out the combustible engine. Is it worth investing public dollars in? That's a really difficult call to make. I would love to see us doing that without having to force you know, without having to subsidize the auto industry, because I mean, you'd hope that they're able to do this project on their own because, you know, they are going to be still the ones reaping the benefits from selling these electric automobiles. So I'm not sure, I don't, I'm not going to say no to it, but I'm not sure that I would feel comfortable campaigning on the idea that we're going to help provide money to the auto sector to shift over to, a, to electric automobiles. But yes, Working with the auto sector, absolutely. I've already talked about this. You can probably see it in some other, well, I don't know if it was ever recorded, but I have definitely talked about this, about you know working with the auto industry to phasing out the combustible engine. The, the reason I phased the question that way, and this will be a sub-question, I can go out now and buy an electric-driven car. Yeah. I cannot buy one that's manufactured in Canada. And... Uh, you talked about the importance of the environment and people. Uh, people means jobs for people. Yeah. Because you can't live without jobs. And the environment means let's do something about this 25%. And one way to do it is to try to increase the use of electronic vehicles. But let's have them made in Canada. Like, for instance, I drive a RAV4. I can buy a RAV4 that's electronic driven, but it's not made in Canada. I can go out and get a Honda, but it's not made in Canada either. Right. Um, and as far as the big three that are controlled by the uh, United States, there's no way. They've, they've got, the, well, in fact, they're closing Oshawa down for heaven's sakes, even after we gave them billions of dollars to try and sustain them staying there. Yes. Um, that's why I think uh, if we're going to engage in this, and I can see it being very sellable if it means jobs for Canadians and it means a reduction in pollution. Anyway, I'd like you to think about it. Uh, uh, well, sure, you make two great points. Reduction in pollution and jobs for Canadians, I think, are things that hopefully most Canadians will, would want and appreciate. Certainly, I do. Uh, but you also said in there of how we have you know, provided money to the Oshawa plant and it's closing it down and, and yeah. that reflects badly on the Canadian government. So that's the part that's a tough political sell to, to say that we're going to give money to the auto manufacturers. Now, having said that, I've also talked about taking away the $60 billion that are in subsidies that the oil and gas industry gets and putting that into the green sector, which is exactly. the fastest growing part of our economy. Yeah. So the, the two may have some overlap there. It's something that I'm going to consider more, you know, after this conversation that I have with you. And if you wanted to send me some more ideas on it, you're, you're welcome to. I would definitely read an email from you on that. But again, I, I'm, I'm being honest. Like, I, I do have a difficult time saying that I, it's a probably a good idea to give money to the auto sector for some of the reasons that I've already said. But we can work with them to make sure that, I mean, I, I would love the idea of turning our manufacturing plants into producing electric automobiles. I can tell you that I am for that on board 100%. Just one point of misunderstanding. I never yeah. suggested giving the money. I used the word partnership. Okay. And that has a totally different connotation. It would mean that the government would take a stake in the corporation in a shared way. And that's a radical idea, I know. Well, I was trying to think, wasn't didn't, the bailout that was given in 2007, wasn't there supposed to be some sort of equity promised, at least as a holding for the loan or for the, for the, for the bailout money? Yes, and in some cases they sold the shares after about two years, 
And in the case, I believe it was of Chrysler, there was a time limit on it. And at the end of the time limit, Chrysler did not have to pay back. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, um, sorry, go ahead, Stacy. Sorry to interrupt. I'm just concerned that we won't get to everybody's questions. So maybe yeah. if we can. That's a good point. We can sorry. talk, Gordon, if you want to talk more about this, uh, you can send me an email and we, you know, maybe we can even have a phone conversation if you like. Okay, very good. Good. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you, mate. If you Thank ask the next question, I'll just write the email in the meantime. <laughs> okay, Matt has a question. Hey, Andrew, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, just to shift gears a bit, um, uh, diversity has kind of been something that the Green Party has been criticized on in the past. Uh, uh, we don't really have a lot of um, uh, diverse people within higher positions uh, in the Green Party. Um, and I'm curious if you have a strategy for getting uh, more diverse people into the into the party, into leadership positions. Uh, you talked a bit about uh, getting youth engaged. I think that's important. And uh, maybe you can also talk uh, to LGBTQ, um, uh, getting them involved in the Green Party as well. So, yes, I do. And this is a strategy that I implemented when I was a candidate in Canada. I think that having more diversity is something that Greens want because we want to be able to reach out to more communities because we want them to know that we speak to them and we hear them and that we all have the shared values of, of helping the environment, helping our people, and helping our economy. But I am not a fan of what we, we had in a seminar and this is not the term I use, this is the term that the people leading the seminar use, tokenism. Just being able to grab people who reflect a certain look so we can put them on the website as candidates. I don't think that that's true to green values and it's definitely not true to a grassroots party. I think the grassroots candidate, I think that being a grassroots party, I think our members should have the choice of who they elect to represent them as their candidate in their riding. What I would do, the way that I would do this, would be, again, because this goes back to having strong EDAs, so we can go out into these different communities during the regular year and, and talk to them and listen to them and try to build bridges to join them into our community. And, and hopefully they will bring in others into our community and they will volunteer for an election or two and then feel comfortable enough to want and attach the party in a positive way to run as a candidate. This, that to me is real. It's going to be slower. It's not as quick as just finding, trying to for, come, pull people in to be candidates. It's not going to be that fast. It's a slower process, but to me it's, it's real. And when I was a candidate, as I said, when I was a candidate in Canada, I would reach out in particular to the Canada Muslim Association because I could see how our values related to a lot of their values. And at least two members of that community have asked to volunteer on my leadership campaign. And that shows to me that this is a, a proven way to work. They reached out to me. I think that that's the best way to go. I think that that's a real way of making our party more diverse. Okay, Joanna, would you like to ask your question? Thank you, Stacy. <clears throat> Thank you, Andrew. It's nice of you to uh, spend your time talking to us tonight. I actually live in Ottawa. Oh, I am where? Ottawa. Uh, I'm in the Ottawa Centre riding in Westboro. Um, oh, Westboro is beautiful. It's great because I have a dog and walk to the river. Um, my question, at the risk of being a huge question, maybe we could just keep it to uh, one thing that you would do the same continue to do uh, following Elizabeth May and one thing that you would do differently from her if elected as leader. Thank you. Um, the same is the work ethic. Um, Elizabeth does her best to get out to every region of Canada. She came to a fundraiser that I had when I was running in 2018 provincially. Um, she came out to a breakfast that we had earlier this year for the by-election 
and I mean, it's amazing just how much she, she just works so hard. You know, I have, I, I've had people kind of CC me on emails to her and she responds. And as I told you, I have a backlog of emails. I don't know how she does it, but she's able to do that and write books at the same time. So good for her. I mean, it's amazing. So that's definitely something I would continue to do. Uh, differently is focus, um, putting more of an effort, putting the effort, putting the focus on the leader. I think that she did that far too much and areas around her, the, the Sandwich Gulf Islands area, so Vancouver Island. You know, Kitchener is a great example of where if Mike had a bit more support and a bit more attention, especially leading up to the election, let alone during the election in 2019, I really think you guys could have won. And I'm sure you probably all agree. So I feel that we need to focus more across the country. Now, as an election goes on, you're going to in, have internal polls and you're going to realize what part of the country and what areas, what ridings are doing better than others. That's when you focus more on those ridings during the election and you put more focus on them, you put more resources to try to win those ridings. But we're not going to start building up riding associations across Canada if we keep ignoring them. We have to put more effort into focus on them. And this kind of plays into this. During the election, rather than just putting myself in front of the camera, I would get as many candidates with me in front of the camera as possible and draw attention to them and even make them talk during pressers and me just say silent. So to force the media to pay attention to them. So I would start by saying, this is so-and-so, you may have heard me say this before, this is so-and-so, she has a BA in economics, she's been in the banking sector for many years, she would make an excellent minister of finance. And by showing more candidates, we're showing Canadians the team that they would elect. I don't want to be just the head of the Green Party. I want to be the lead voice amongst all these amazing voices. That's what I would do differently. Okay, Simon, you're next. Thanks. So. I, I, it seems as though I should start by dropping my Ottawa connection. I grew up in the east end of Ottawa. Oh, great. Not, not quite as far east as Orleans in the, I was in the Beacon Hill area. Okay, that's a beautiful spot, Beacon Hill. Yeah, it is pretty nice down near the river. I could walk to the river as well, but I didn't have a dog. <laughs> so I, I, I think a lot about Indigenous issues in Canada. Yes. And uh, I'll just pick on one particular aspect and ask you, um, from the point of view of the Green Party leader, what opportunities do you see for reform in the structure of national policing that would benefit a nation to nation relationship between Canada and its indigenous peoples? Well, in general, I'm in favor of more autonomy for um, first nations, um, having more of the, having them more take control of their governing structure. And this includes um, sentencing in, in, um, in uh, court matters. I have to be honest that I haven't a thought of the idea of policing as well, but I'm sure that that's something that is plausible for sure, based on the fact that these regions should have more autonomy. That alone would suggest that they should have some type of, of policing, maybe um, two levels of policing, which many municipalities have. There's municipal policing for a lot of municipalities and there's also provincial so on a matter like that having a reserve police and a federal police but those are just things that i'm thinking about right off the top of my head if you've given this some thought i'd like to hear more about it well i i think i i don't want to go on for for any length of time on it but i think given sort of the spring and summer that we've had um, and actually stretching back into the winter with the the uh, conflicts out, out in uh, BC around the, uh, the the pipeline. Yeah. It, I mean, I, the, the simplest thing seems to be that the, the federal government, the RCMP, should get out of the business of provincial policing entirely because it just muddies the waters. 
about who's responsible out there. And then the whole question of jurisdiction of uh, settler nation police forces on indigenous land. I think there's a really good question to be answered there because it, it seems unworkable the way that it is right now. And I'd like to, to hear a solution from someone. Well, like I said, I'm, I'm for um, more nations having more autonomy and doing so they're able to opt out of the Indian Act, which is a very good thing when that's able to happen. Um, so it's something that as leader, first thing I would do is as leader of the Green Party become the prime minister because that's when you actually can start making these type of uh, decisions. And, and so that requires the Green Party to get elected, which again is why I feel I'm the best candidate to get the Green Party elected. Having said that, once elected, Aboriginal issues is going to be a very top priority for me. Uh, this is something that I've, you know, been, I've, I was, grew up close to a reserve, um, visited a few times when I was young, know the problems that are there, and they, those problems were ingrained in me very young. And it's one of the reasons why I became an, a politician to help First Nations and poverty in general. So that would be something that would be a matter of sitting down with First Nation leaders after elected and seeing what would be the best and most secure way of going forward. Okay, as we move to some things up, I wondered whether there was anything that you haven't been asked that you uh, would like to share with us? Um, anything that we haven't addressed already? Oh, there's, there's tons of things. Voting reform is a, is a huge passion of mine. I think I have a plan that can uh, lead us to being elected on that plan. Um, again, we, we kind of touch a little bit about the economy. Um, it's great that the environment was actually talked about a little bit in this meeting. Actually, surprisingly, the environment gets little, I get asked very little about my environmental policies. So I don't know um, if, if people want to talk more about that, but I'd rather just, you know, I'm here to listen and to answer your questions. So um, I think I've made, hopefully if you want to see more about me and more points that I made, there's tons of material on the internet that you can watch and you can check out my website for some clips. Very good. Um, I'm going to post uh, in the chat some of our upcoming meetings. Next week, we actually have two meetings, one on Tuesday and one on Wednesday uh, because of some conflicts. Um, and so please let us know if, if uh, you aren't already being invited to all of the meetings where you're welcome to join. Uh, and I want to thank everyone here for coming and joining the conversation and for Andrew for, for giving his time so generously. Oh, that's uh, it. Uh, You're done already? Yeah, it's fairly, fairly short. <laughs> oh, I can stick around if people wanted to ask more questions. I don't, I, I'm usually on, these things usually last an hour and a half to two hours. Yes, it was um, because we have a meeting every week, we wanted to be respectful of people's times. But so I welcome anyone who would like to um, leave, it's fine. And anybody else who has any more questions, uh, it sounds like Andrew's willing to, quite happy to stay. Yeah, and I have a two hour, I have another event after this at 10 o'clock. So, you know, um, that shows my dedication. I'm willing to stay even because of that. But if people are gonna leave, maybe I can just say this real quick. Um, the two things that I'm sure you probably know is that um, every contestant needs 150 signatures. So to, to be on the ballot, and we have to finish getting these signatures by the end of this month. So if you could click on this link, please, and nominate everyone. It's not an endorsement. It's to keep people on the ballot, and we're a grassroots party, so hopefully that makes sense to keep as many people on the ballot as possible to give people choice. So if you could please click on that link and, and nominate 
the candidates and make sure you answer the reply email that you get to make sure that it actually is you. Uh, the second point is that we are possibly having an election coming up either this year or early next year and funds are important. So there's a link for fundraising. That link actually counts towards a goal that I need to reach again to stay on the ballot. I'm pretty close to it, but if everyone on this link, everyone in this chat actually made a small donation, it would go a long way to me just getting over that hump so I can stop campaigning, which is, or so I can stop making fundraising calls, which I've been doing the last few weeks and getting back to campaigning, which is why I got into politics to reach out to people and listen to them, not try to take their money. So if you can do me a favor and make a small donation there, I would really appreciate it. It goes to the Green Party to make us have a stronger election next time around. And again, if people want us, me to stick around for a bit, I can certainly do so. But yeah, Stacey, if you got to get going, thanks for arranging this. I really appreciate it. It's good seeing you. Yeah, you as well. Andrew, uh, the, uh, links that you, the links that you posted might have been shared privately because I didn't see them come up in the chat. Oh, they did. They went to Gordon privately. <laughs> He sent me, I think he sent me, an, he sent me his email address. So it just automatically went to him. Thank you, Matt, for pointing it out. No problem. Here's the fun okay. link. In the meantime, David does have another question. Thank you, Stacy. Yes, Andrew, uh, thanks for hanging around just a little bit extra. Um, I just wanted to say that I've been trying to watch as many of these town hall meetings and uh, the recordings of them as possible. Yes. Uh, Anna Keenan has apparently uh, been doing some of the more stellar ones, in my opinion, and I haven't unfortunately seen uh, your your town hall that you had with Dimitri. Um, okay. So I'm I'm going to go back. I'm probably going to watch that tonight. But I hear you did a stellar job with that, and in particular, oh, nice. uh, I was told that you did a great job talking about foreign policy. Yes. Um, just in the event I don't actually get to that video, like I'm planning on doing, I'm wondering if you might be able to share with us um, uh, just uh, some uh, tidbits of, of your view on foreign policy, how we as Canadians should be uh, refocusing. Well, I mean, I certainly have what I could, I think foreign policy is a very important part of this campaign. And it's actually something that's not really being talked about too much. Now, having said that, there is gonna be a debate on foreign policy. Uh, if you were to follow me on Twitter or look at my website or look at one of the other candidates' websites, I'm sure they put it on there as well. I think it's on September 10th, but I'm just going by memory, I'm not sure. Actually, if you really wanted to give me a second, I can look it up on my calendar real quickly. But there is gonna be a, a, pol uh, a, a debate by rabble.ca on foreign policy. Um, Yes, it's on the 10th, September the 10th at 7 p.m. So I didn't, in the debate with Dimitri, I really didn't talk much about trade. We really talked about essentially, what I mostly talked about was how he wanted to eliminate the military. And I actually took the opposite view. I actually think we should have a military, but we need to get back into peacekeeping. Now that's not to say that we need to, um, he also talked about the Security Council seat. I actually think that we've spent too much time, our priorities in foreign policy has kind of been backwards in my opinion. We've spent a lot of time trying to impress the UN and to get on the Security Council seat. If we had issues, we can erase them with the Security Council. We don't have to have a seat on them. It's not as effective, but we can still raise issues to the Security Council and put them to a vote. My view is Canada used to be a leader in peacekeeping. And I want to get back to that. I've volunteered for Amnesty International for over a year because I strongly concerned about human rights. And there was a time when Canada was the leader in peacekeeping and we are falling right off the map. I think there's about 40 peacekeepers right now for a Canadian, for a Canadian Canada right now. And that's far too low considering what's happening in, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, in um, other, you know, we missed the boat in Darfur and Rwanda. There's so many other issues, uh, there examples that I could show of where we could be making a big difference in this world. 
So I joined the Green Party because we care about people too. So for me, people means protecting people. And this is, we are very fortunate in Canada to have many resources. And I like to put those to good use to help people. But that was the what we talked about with Dimitri. If you want to have uh, other questions about specifically on foreign policy, I'd be happy to answer. Okay, Gordon has another question. Sorry, I clicked on the wrong button. Um, going back to what you said about electoral reform, Andrew, um, um, are you a fan of mixed member proportional or do you prefer a pure proportional system? Here's the link of what I prefer. Oh, okay. Um, I had some help working on this from a very smart individual. Um, I'm not going to, don't know if I want to say, if he, if he wants me to point out who he is, but um, it's up to him if he wants to, <laughs> to point that out. But uh, someone very close to many people on this phone, on this line, uh, helped me work on this project. Right. It's essentially mixed member, but the mix that the set off part is not within the House of Commons itself. It's actually using the Senate as the set off part. So it's not creating so much an elected Senate. It's actually the set off from the um, elected House. I think that this is something that Canadians will buy into in a big way because not only does it deal with electoral reform, it deals with Senate reform. And one of the things that we were very particular about when we put together this proposal was addressing concerns that people had with electoral reform. And I think we answered every single one of them. In this system, you're still able to elect your own member of parliament. You're still able to just use one ballot if you like. There's options to use different ballots, but if, you really, if it really came down to it, it's just single one ballot. And it's still a proportional system. And it's fair. It's, it's also addressing the fact that, you know, the Senate is appointed and they basically just rubber stamp um, policy from the House of Commons. Um, everyone that has seen this proposal really seems to like it. Some even have heard it first and when they explain it, like, oh, that'll never work. And what's really amazing is even the people who have said that to me have come back to me and said, you know what, I looked at it and I really like it. So it's 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 overwhelmingly i've got an overwhelmingly positive feedback from this policy or from this proposal it hasn't been updated since the previous election by the way that the we put this for together in 2017 for the electoral reform commission um and haven't updated it since but it still applies it's just some of the graphics are old but again it's something that people just seem to be overwhelmingly positive of, and I think it's a system that Canadians will buy into. Would you like to see an alternate proposal? It's maybe similar, but uh, it would be different in certain aspects, uh, which David has seen, and uh, I'd be glad to send it to you. Sure. Yep, good, I'll do that. Andrew, could I follow up on this, on the bicameral mixed member proportionals um, plan yep. that you just showed us? Sure. Um, I'm a little bit embarrassed to say that this is the first time I've seen it, but oh, don't, don't be embarrassed about that. That's no, <laughs> I, mean, it's, I mean, you have to really be a policy hog to have looked at all the, the proposals sent to the electoral reform committee for you to really know much about it. So that's, that's not an issue. Don't worry about that. So I'll, I'll give you my first reaction to it and you can tell me what you think. Um, yeah. This can't be done without uh, constitutional reform. No. But how are you going to get that done? That because it can, it, it's addressed in there. It can be done okay. without constitutional reform. However, having said that, constitutional amendments would make it much better and stronger. Um, the the most ideal version would require constitutional amendments, absolutely. But as we say in the proposal, this is something that I think a lot of provinces will buy into because it's addressing some of the concerns that provinces have had for many years about being unrepresented in parliament. Uh, the Senate, if you know how it's divided up, mm -hmm. was divided up 
you know, back in 1867 and kind of have this hodgepodge, you know, um, fixes over the next few year, over the preceding years as provinces come on board. And it's still very disproportionate for many provinces. So I think the provinces would, would certainly buy into this. And if we ran on this as one of our platform points and we we're elected on that, then that's a mandate to the other parties to help work with us on this, to help get it together. But having said that, there is a watered down version, and that's not using the best terminology, but there is a version of this that can be done without any constitutional amendments. It's just not as, it just wouldn't have as much teeth. Mm. Okay, thank you. But it is, but it is dressed, addressed in there, those, that, those exact okay. points. If you were to look through the, the website, we do discuss that. I'll have a look, thank you. Okay, does anybody else have an additional question? Looks like we might be ready to um, finish up then. But thanks again, Andrew. Um, and uh, I hope that if people do have uh, additional questions, they'll contact contact Andrew. Uh, make sure to let us know if you um, want an invite to next week and haven't signed up for the leadership chat uh, emails. And it looks, uh, it looks like you're at the, the link I sent. <laughs> Everybody, you've you've piqued everyone's curiosity. No, no one's asking are, more, yeah, no one's asking more questions because they're all looking at the. the uh, we we are Just, all I, policy wong. I'm totally fine with that. I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> so, but anyway, thank you all. Thank you again. Please um, look at the uh, the links I said there for the nomination and the donation. That would really mean a lot. And you know. Thank you again. Well, or sorry, Kitchener is amazing. You guys do some great work. You should be very proud of all that you've accomplished. And I know you're going to elect uh, an MP very, very soon. And hopefully I can help with that. <laughs> Lovely. Thanks. It was nice to see you again, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. And good luck tonight. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Nice everyone. to see you, Andrew. Likewise. Thank Lo you. Take care. Love your positivity. Thank you. I appreciate you saying Thank that you again. Thank you very much. <laughs> yep.